for joining today's meeting. Um, I'm Miriam Jones. I'm one of the co-leads of the Permafrost Collaboration Team. And we are joining forces with the data team today. And our topic is to discuss ground ice. Um, so first I'll introduce why we're doing this. Um, and then we have a couple of speakers who have a little bit of background with ground ice data from various um, backgrounds. And then we'll move forward into a discussion on um, sort of our, what our aims are and what, uh, how we can best go about moving forward with new ground ice products. Um, so Meredith, can you go ahead and share the slides? And in the meantime, Mike, if you have anything you would like to add to introduce yourself from the data thanks, side. Miriam. Thanks, Miriam. Just wanna say thanks for uh, initiating this joint meeting and appreciate the opportunity to share some data perspectives. Um, for everyone, uh, your awareness, I'm the data team co-lead. Uh, my counterpart, Jonathan Blythe, I don't know if he's on the line, but um, he was also uh, part of organizing this call. So looking forward to it and thanks again. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to, I just threw some slides together. Um, so on the left, you'll see the current existing circumarctic map of ground ice in the Arctic, which was produced uh, or led by Jerry Brown et al. in 1997. And since then, there's only been, you know, smaller scale efforts to um, try to improve upon this, but there's clearly lots more data that has been collected in the intervening years and ways in which we could improve on this um, ground ice map. So before I get too deep into this, I'm sure most of you already know what ground ice is, but there's some images on the right which show um, various types of, of ground ice um, found in the Arctic. And many of these are very large features, um, ice wedges and buried glacial ice. And, um, and then on the sort of in the front, I have um, some core imagery from a permafrost peatland in Alaska that also has um, yeah. some ice. So ground ice can take many different forms. It's basically the ice that is found in permafrost. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the amount of ground ice um, and the type of ground ice can have major implications on planning of infrastructure in the Arctic, um, also can influence hydrology, uh, ecosystem change, as well as carbon and nutrient cycling, uh, which includes feedbacks to climate. Um, it's of great interest to climate modeling um, because of the feedbacks to carbon dioxide and methane um, and other greenhouse gases that can be emitted from thawing permafrost. Um, and having a better map or understanding of the spatial extent of ground ice um, could improve upon these modeling efforts. Next slide, please. Um, so Christina Shadel and I have created a ground ice survey um, for both data holders and data users. We know there's lots of data out there in various formats, um, also various types of um, parameters that have been collected related to ground ice and some people inadvertently probably collecting uh, ground ice information with um, other data that they were collecting. Um, and so we want to know what kind of maps can be created from the data that is out there and how we can improve upon um, the, the existing ground ice map for the circumarctic. And so we wanted to have a discussion with people who understand um, the, or may even have data um, related to ground ice, um, but then also have the focus be on 
um, the data side of things. How can we collect data in a standardized way and how we can create a, um, a product that can be scaled. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, and I'm just going to, let's see. Um, sorry, I don't have the schedule in front of me. <laughs> I can't remember if, if we have Tom or Brendan going first. It's me first and then Brendan. Okay, okay. So first I'm gonna introduce Tom Douglas. <laughs> he is with um, Krell and Fairbanks. And he, um, I guess is a, is a chemist, but has done a lot of work in, in permafrost and um, has been, played a large part in expanding the permafrost tunnel in Fairbanks. And I will let, turn the floor over to him and let him share his thoughts on ground ice. But thank you, Miriam, and hello, everybody. A lot of familiar names here and folks from far away. So good day or good night or good morning to wherever you are. So kind of, hi, hi Jeff. Um, sort of luckily, Brandon and I had a little bit of a back and forth and the ideas we had, I think worked out pretty well. I guess you'll all see, but um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on smaller scale uh, sort of sites around Fairbanks. I'll talk about the tunnel a little bit and sort of ways we're trying to scale upward, but more at the plot or field level. And then Brendan has some really nice, you know, circumarctic type view of things. So hopefully it'll dovetail pretty well. Um, with Jeff Curry of DOT on the phone, I got to be really delicate on this image on the right. But my point here is that you can see this as part of Goldstream Road and obviously maintaining this road's a big challenge. Um, and I just kind of want to talk about if you look at the right, that's kind of one scale. If you look at the left, all that, those little, you know, pieces of uh, segregated ice in there, you know, that's very hard to identify without things like cores or, or other types of data. So um, from, the, from the perspective of DOT, kind of on the right and even larger scale, all the way down to literally, you know, one SIPRI core in one location, how can we talk about ground ice? Um, uh, next slide, please. So there's, there's myriad reasons to think or worry about ground ice. Uh, what we're starting to see, for instance, some, some upland sites around town, I've got kind of a schematic diagram to the left, but um, sort of the, with the TZ would be sort of the transition zone. So kind of the bottom of typical seasonal thaw, sometimes water or ice kind of ponds there. Um, and my schematic, you can see eventually we're thawing down to where an ice wedge is, the top of that kind of white carrot shaped structure in the bottom. Once that happens, you can really route water because obviously you go from ice to water, you create some gaps, uh, you lose a little bit of volume, but also when that ice becomes water, it can head down slope. So what we're starting to see, you see this image to the right, um, water kind of falling along these sort of not necessarily linear, but sort of semi-linear features in the subsurface. Sometimes they pop to the surface. Other times you'll see a little, almost a ephemeral stream disappear down a meter or two. And then a couple hundred meters downstream, it pops back up all silty and trees and things are getting sucked into trenches. So obviously ground ice can play a really big role um, in moving material and, and sort of addressing or responding to thaw uh, pressures. Next slide. <laughs> So what we're trying to do it at some sites is, is, I think a neat way to look at change over time is with repeat LIDAR. And so here's a site, if you've ever been to the Creamers Field Migratory Bird Refuge near Fairbanks, um, the yellow line there in the upper image shows uh, a 500 meter transect we have there. And um, at the bottom left is a person kind of standing inside where those deciduous trees are. And then if you look a little bit to the left of the, where the, there looks like there's a bit of a cut um, in the yellow line, um, you can almost see clusters of trees that are almost your, with your eyes, you're sort of mapping ice wedges with vegetation. Um, to the bottom there, you'll see that in, in about a three meter, a three to four year, sorry, time frame, we have some, you know, meter or two of thaw along this kind of thermocarst front, which is sort of those brown, the, the really dark brown, um, just kind of uh, south of our yellow line. And you can actually start, to, if you look at the sort of reds and yellow colors, you can kind of make out that these are degrading ice wedge polygons. Um, from coring and other things, we know that ice wedge terrain extends all the way out into the, the rest of our transect. 
Um, it's only really thawing in this sort of deciduous zone. Um, it's a little bit warmer there. It's a couple degrees C warmer. And there is kind of a thermal karst thaw front sort of moving into that. But LIDAR is a really nice way at a big scale to look at some of these sort of heterogeneities and changes over time. Next slide. And then I'll show in a little bit uh, much smaller um, scale LIDAR measurements we're making inside the tunnel. So right here. So what we found, which is really neat, we're, we're doing studies of creep inside the tunnel. So we've excavated, uh, you know, I don't know, four or 500 meters of additional tunnel. We tripled the size of it. And uh, we've come across, you know, massive ice features. And here's a nice picture. The image in the middle is, you know, the middle images are true color images. You can kind of see I've labeled a couple of things, ice wedges and silt. Um, and we're doing a bunch of coring and sort of geotechnical kind of measurements. But we found that our terrestrial LIDAR that we use to look for creep, which we don't see very much of, but um, responds back with the ice really well. So if you look at kind of the orange colors in here, that would be these sort of massive ice deposits. So we're now at almost like a centimeter scale of being able to map uh, these features. If you look at the segregated ice to the right and you go from the true color up to the colors, you'll see we don't quite capture all of those linear features there, but we're getting pretty well. And, and we're now applying machine learning analyses to this because what I want to know is what percentage of the tunnel walls are different types of ice and, and what's the smallest features we can see. Um, obviously, this works really well inside a maintained frozen tunnel that, that doesn't have you know, a lot of thaw going on. I would argue perhaps along river cuts or recent sort of thermal karst um, scarps and things, people could do similar work. But um, if anything, maybe we are sort of lucky to be able to work inside that sort of frozen laboratory. Um, but I think we can start to talk a little more about sort of geo statistics of these sort of the sizes and, and percentage of the walls being these different cryo structures or cryo features. Next slide. And this one's just kind of a, I think a beautiful shot. This is basically the ceiling of the tunnel. Um, and the orange, you can basically, you can map out these ice wedges. This looks a lot like when you see an aerial image of you know, the high Arctic where there's very little vegetation. Um, you can see the ice wedge polygons. And again, this is basically in the ceiling and a little bit of the walls of the tunnel. But um, yeah, my goal is to sort of try to, to, to see what we can do in terms of identifying the percentage of ice. And then also we've done a whole ton of chemistry and microbiology work uh, throughout the tunnel. And so we're relating those to the different ice and, and non-ice, you know, ice cemented material is a goal. Next slide. So here's kind of a summary and, and hopefully we can go from here to what Brennan's gonna talk about. Um, you know, in the upper left is one of these classic ice wedge polygon views from above. Um, the image in the upper middle is uh, Steve Arconi standing in front of a cut when they put the pipeline in. So that's along the Steese Highway, actually right near the tunnel. So it looks kind of similar to what we see inside there. Um, and then to the upper, that's the upper middle. Upper right, you can see kind of an ice wedge with some plastic deformation of different uh, you know, smaller sort of horizontal segregated ice types. Um, the bottom left, kind of a classic uh, that's up near Giavik, you know, ice cemented material on with a nice kind of peat layer on top of it. Then I've got a core and then some reticulate chaotic ice inside the tunnel. And, and so I think my point here sort of to, to hand it off to, to Brendan, who's going to take you to sort of bigger picture, is when you look at things like either frozen bulk density or gravimetric water content, and maybe we'll talk later about why those might be important, or if you can measure one versus the other, you know, what can you do or how can we relate them? It's easier to measure gravimetric than the frozen bulk density because gravimetric, you just take a sample, weigh it, dry it, look at the delta, the bulk density, you need an actual core and a known volume. So it's a little harder to get those measurements. Um, but I just kind of want to show just some of the variations we've measured. And then also, you know, maybe this group, since there's some data analysis um, going on, I might suggest some sort of relationships between the bulk density and the gravimetric water tent content across different locations or soil types or ice regimes or climates or, or whatnot might start to be kind of a powerful way to look at this. Again, it's much easier to measure gravimetric and I suspect there are more of those measurements out there in various people's data sets. Um, but the frozen bulk density, you know, if you could relate them to one another, um, that would be great. More like relate gravimetric to what the frozen bulk density might be. Um, that's it for me. On to Brendan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Sorry, I was just daydreaming about ground ice. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, yes, our next feature speaker is Brendan O'Neill. He's with the Geological Survey of Canada, and he will be speaking about the, I guess, upscaling of how we can use these localized data sets to upscale to a broader um, spatial scale. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide and <laughs> get right into it. Uh, thanks to Tom. Yeah, Tom has lots of nice pictures, which really like showed the ice nicely. So I think it's a good introduction here. So uh, yeah, I'm coming from this in the context of uh, I've done work in the field on ground ice and more recently done uh, modeling uh, in the development of the ground ice map of Canada, which is a national scale modeling framework uh, that gives estimates of the abundance of uh, relict or buried glacier ice, as we call it, uh, segregated ice and wedge ice. So just an outline for the talk. Basically, I'm going to hopefully spur some conversation about types of ground ice information and how we can use it and some considerations for bridging scales. So next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, when we were developing the ground ice map of Canada, we were like, OK, how can we validate this thing? Uh, so we did it in a variety of ways, and I think it's a bit useful to think about these. Um, so the different types of ground ice information we can use um, to either upscale to create a map or to validate uh, a map or model. So obviously, uh, Tom showed nice pictures of, of boreholes. Uh, it's a great source of data, it's particularly if you have things like bulk density or volumetric uh, ice content. Um, a lot of the data on ground ice, or, some, or there's a good amount of uh, data at exposure. So where people have mapped exposures and uh, figured out the proportion of ice to sediment or icy sediment. Uh, remote sensing techniques to identify terrain features associated with ground ice, uh, and of course, geophysics. So in, the, in our paper where we describe sort of the methodology for our modeling, we use uh, a variety of these data types. So on the left, uh, when we were trying to validate our, our buried glacier ice modeling. Uh, we use observations of large thaw slumps from uh, Steve Coquel's work uh, and saw that there's a fairly good agreement between where slumps, large slumps are mapped and, the, um, and our modeled uh, buried glacier ice. And uh, we also use essentially just presence absence data. So whatever data we could find uh, from literature in Canada um, that described um, occurrences of very glacier ice. On the right, we you can see this is a, a zoom in of the Western Canadian Arctic in the Mackenzie Delta area. We used um, data on ice wedge, both the, the widths of ice wedges and the uh, distribution of polygonal terrain from another paper by Steve Coquel uh, to sort of give some validation of, okay, in our model, we have this decreasing ice abundance towards the coast, or sorry, increasing ice abundance towards the coast. Um, uh, and essentially the, the mapped data in Steve Bokel's paper showed the same. So the density of polygonal terrain moving northward increases and the size of ice wedges also increases. Uh, next slide, please. We also uh, created this ground ice atlas of Canada where we looked at 31 locations across the country, all of which had prior information on ground ice conditions uh, in the literature. So we looked at, okay, how are, how is, how are the ice conditions described in the uh, literature versus our model conditions? And this was actually a really helpful exercise, even though it was mainly qualitative. Um, so that's, yeah, sort of just to give you an idea of the mix of information we use to try to validate. Next slide. So just some general considerations when we think about bridging scales between observations and, and modeling or mapping. Um, is kind of the framework that, that previous ground ice mapping has worked within. So on the IPA map, this is basically associations between large uh, physiographic units and ground ice conditions, very, very broad. Uh, and on the more recent map for Alaska and ours, uh, it's more based on you know, specific surficial deposits and ground ice associations with those deposits. Um, obviously, when if we think of you know, what are the ground ice conditions associated with different deposits? We need to think about, do we have representative sampling within those deposits uh, or within, you know, different environmental historical regimes? So has it been in tundra 
since deglaciation, if it was a glaciated area, uh, or has vegetation changed? Has the forest advanced or, or retreated? Uh, and we also need to think about the depth of the interval of our field observations versus what, we're, what, the, what our intent or, or what our mapping uh, depth is. So on the IPA map, uh, the, the map depicts ground ice in the top 10 to 20 meters. So that's the range they sort of um, present that at. And on the more recent Alaska map and our map, we're saying it's in the top five meters. So uh, with that, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, just a few other considerations on specific ice types. So there's been in the literature lately more estimates on the volume of wedge ice from polygonal uh, polygonal areas. Uh, and these are typically from lowland terrain uh, or like flatter terrain. And that's because you can see wedge ice is very nicely in those settings. However, on hill slopes, the troughs of the ice wedge themselves might be obscured due to downslope movement of material. So it's actually a lot harder to see ice wedges on hill slopes. So when we think of representative sampling, we, all, we need to take into consideration uh, that, that we may be underrepresenting ice wedge conditions uh, in lowlands versus on hill slopes. And then another thing is that uh, all of these estimates rely on an assumed 2D profile for ice wedges, which I think in, in many respects is reasonable. Often it's assumed to be a triangle for epigenetic terrain or a rectangle if it's syngenetic, uh, but also the widths. So we need good data on widths of ground ice uh, or widths of ice wedges if we're going to use this kind of technique to estimate volumes. Next slide, please. For uh, buried glacier ice, uh, there's also a consideration that it's easy to identify where it's melting or in some cases where it has melted. So we can look at exposures. We can see thaw, thaw slumps easily in imagery. Uh, we can see involuted terrain. Um, however, where we can't see, where we can't see evidence of it, well, how contiguous is it? That, I think that's something that hasn't been well constrained. Uh, so if we look at this image of Banks Island, this is from the Jesse Moraine, where there's a ton of thaw slumps uh, in relict ice. Uh, but in these areas where there aren't thaw slumps, you know, what is the, like how much relict ice is actually there? And I think that's, uh, we don't have a good idea of that yet. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned before, there's these depths of interest. So when we were sort of trying to uh, validate and come up with uh, estimates for ice content for our, for mapping, uh, we compiled or we compiled data on previous studies um, for ground ice. And as you can see in this column, there were, the observations are reported to different depth intervals. So commonly, you know, it might say in the top one meter of permafrost, we have this ground ice content, or in the top three to four meters or in the top 10 meters. So we need, I think, a strategy for moving from field observations uh, to whatever interval we're mapping. So if, we're, if we have a bunch of data on the ice conditions in the top one meter, how do we transfer that to what it is in the top five meters? Uh, so you can click the advance. And one way around this might, to be, might be to sort of assume uh, a decay curve if you're in, for example, epigenetic permafrost uh, based on smaller sample sizes. So if you have a good amount of data from the top two meters and, and some data deeper, well, and you know something about the deposit history, then maybe you can assume a curve uh, and then derive that five meter value from one meter or two meter uh, field observations. Um, next slide. So yeah, just some final thought, thoughts or questions. Uh, so how can we better constrain ice content estimates? So like the ones I presented for wedge ice or very glacial ice. And what's the best way to mine and synth synthesize different ground ice data? And I think Tom brought up a good point on this. Uh, like we have a ton of geotechnical boreholes that have grav gravimetric moisture content, but how can we use that to figure out you know, what are the different types of ice and, and what that means in volumetric terms, which is really uh, what, what we should be interested in. Uh, so thank you. Thanks so much, Brendan. Um, that was a really uh, interesting talk and um, I think uh, leave some food for thought for how we proceed here with um, upscaling uh, 
existing data or even compiling existing data um, to get it to a point where we can upscale it. So I don't know if anyone who is in the call would, has any questions that they'd like to ask right off the bat. Um, maybe I'll give a minute or two to see. So, so I think uh, it's Vladimir Romanovsky here. Um, Hi. Yeah, uh, kind of uh, reiterate the, what uh, Brendan just said at the very end. Um, so th there's many places where you know that ground is there, even ice wedges, but we don't see any indication of, of it uh, from the surface. And it's not only like Yedema and Fairbanks area, but also um, even in tundra, on the Tussock tundra, uh, we don't see any, any evidence because they're not really active. So we don't see the, those uh, you know, polygons because they're not really active and they're not degrading either. So we don't see troughs. Um, so what, and, and there is nothing to, to do with uh, geotechnical things there because it's just a, just a tundra wilderness. So what, what to do is that, what, what's your, your suggestions? And, and when you do this mapping, uh, again, uh, it's very dangerous to say there is no ice because we don't see it, right? That's probably yeah, a question that's to Brandon a very good first, point. but also to Tom as well. So we need we need to do something about it. <laughs> if you want, yeah, that's that's an excellent to, to, point. To have our <laughs> maps are useful, otherwise, uh, or at least not misleading. Yeah. yeah, and so Vlad's point on, um, yeah, if you have no evidence of of ground ice, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's a good point, and um, that's kind of why we approached our our mapping from more of a process based like rules model. So we basically say, if we have these set of conditions, we would expect ground ice based on what we know about how it forms. Um, so it's not, it's not data dependent, the prediction, the, but it's informed by um, what we know from the data. Obviously it has other limitations <laughs> based on that methodology as well. Well, I, I have another short question to, to Tom. So uh, this still people still measuring gravimetric uh, you know, water content or whatever. I mean, obviously it should be. And, and if you use uh, you know the the cores from the from the borehole, it's very easy. I mean, you know the volume. It's very easy to you know record actually the the volumetric water content. Is still this practice practice that uh, people still continue to measure just you know gravimetric water content? I think a lot of people in the biology and geochemistry fields, yes, because they tend to be sort of focused on the upper bit of you know the top of the permafrost, and so um, people use uh, jackhammers, they use shovels, they chip away, and they end up with kind of a surface sample. So yeah, there are still people doing that. I think engineers and obviously geotechnical people that want more information, they will get a core. But again, if you're trying to get a grab sample somewhere, you're just gonna grab what you can. And if you don't have a core, you're not gonna have that, that, that beautiful volume. Um, so yeah, there are still people doing it, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I uh, see that Jeff Curry has his hand raised and anyone else who wants to ask a question, you can either raise your hand or type um, your question in the chat and we'll get to it. I was just gonna point out that the Department of Transportation does gravimetric measurements pretty much exclusively. And we do that for <coughs> permafrost, non-permafrost, any sample, I mean, moisture content is a standard, standard thing to do. But I would also point out that Statistically speaking, you're getting a biased sample from any given exploration because we don't do a gravimetric measurement of, of ice. If it's ice, we, we log it as ice and, and you're done because there's not a lot of point in confirming infinite moisture.
Thanks for that comment. I see Jonathan has his hand up. Hello, sorry I was late. I missed the first couple of minutes, but I think uh, have have has anybody tried to use a vector based model to depict um, things like highways where these samples are being taken along a feature or maybe even have like uh, for cores, I can imagine that's like a profile that's going in vertically into the ground. So you can actually map things by the sampling feature rather than trying to convert these data to a raster, which would make pretty pictures, but like people are pointing out, you know, you have to fill the gaps and maybe misleading in some cases. Anyone want to jump in or have any insight into that? Can by vector you just mean like a polygon uh, situation, or is that what you mean? Polygon is one kind. So if you know, I know that they do that for the wedges. Um, but then you were talking about cores, which would have like more on a two dimensional surface be at one point or in a 3D map would have a vertical profile. Um, and then the highway example, you're taking samples along a man-made feature or a planned man-made feature. So you can map that as a line. Yeah, well, I think historically it has kind of, uh, a lot of the mapping has kind of been that approach where you have some idea of profiles with depth within a superficial geology unit, for example, and then you, you basically extrapolate that point measurement or those multiple point measurements to that entire uh, superficial geology polygon. I'm not sure if that helps. Right. Right. Uh... I guess if you keep the data in its vector format, then you could um, you you could use it in very in many different analyses. But if we're if our product that we're distributing is the is tied to a specific analysis that you know you're extrapolating, like you said, to a larger area, uh, then people are just kind of stuck with that product to be able to interpret it for whatever they're trying to do. So it'd be nice if you could also create products based on the vector data. I'm not sure this goes exactly to your point, Jonathan, but one of the big problems with the limitations of these borehole data is that they are individual point location data points. And you're sampling just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the of the ground in that area. And we uh, have been doing, DOT has been doing a lot more with geophysics just in the last couple of years, largely based on research and work that, uh, that Trell developed. And, uh, and that is going to, that creates a two-dimensional map potentially. Um, so I'm not sure if that goes to your vector question, but that's another data set that is perhaps more powerful than a bunch of individual boreholes. Dr. Dr. Yuri Shur used to always tell the story about uh, an exploration program in Russia where they drilled miles and miles and miles of, of road and the drillers had the enough latitude to pick the location to drill. So they drilled in the middle of every ice, every, every, every polygon and they showed no ground ice over this, uh, this in, incredibly long feature. But, uh, but there was. <laughs> uh, Jeff, I like your comment. It's Vladimir. Uh, when I came to the United States 92, I was kind of preaching about using uh, geophysics for particular for this reason in, in engineering. So I, I'm, I'm very happy that 30 years later, you finally 
got to the point that you 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 believe that it's necessary. Yeah, it, it, um, we we are using it quite routinely now, and it's a function of several things. Number one, recognizing the value and the technology. The uh, uh, couple brown couple uh, capacitive resistance is a very user-friendly device. And that's, that's one that Prell sort of pioneered the use of up here at the mapping, mapping ice and permafrost. And, uh, and we have a unit now that we use, like I say, quite routinely combined with GPR in particular. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty valuable stuff. My experience with geophysics in the 90s was not good um maybe that was well because my experience be, yeah because the you use just pro yeah user you, friendliness yeah you use just profiling instead of uh, instead of sounding it was definitely much more work to do then than it's, it is now i mean physically but uh all methods were already there that time and yeah they showed it i mean in russia it was used very very widely but here it was very strong resistance. And I don't know, I don't know history because during the pipeline construction there, uh, they paid the big money to some geophysical uh, company who did just simple electrical profiling, which is you know very limited uh, use. And based on that engineers said, oh yeah, it's yeah, not useful data. And, and, and that was pretty, pretty sad about about this uh, but that's the history yeah. and that's yeah like that's why i'm saying i'm glad that <laughs> engineers changed their minds finally <laughs> about geophysics good i see that there's some discussion in the chat about um estimating um bulk density from gravimetric water or how they can be used together. Um, I don't know if somebody who commented in the chat wants to jump in or I can read out what is written there, um, which will be perhaps more boring, but- um, hey, hey, Hazel, this is Mike with the data team. Just before you get to that, I'm just wondering if we can get a high level uh, description from the speakers, just generally give us some, some sense of how these data are stored in your respective agencies. Um, just, you know, are they on local machines? Are they on uh, systems where you know a data can be service enabled? Are there incentives to share the data with people outside of the immediate uh, research team? A lot of this, what I'm hearing, uh, seem like specialized studies, data created to understand a certain process. Um, but in cases of making uh, atlases, obviously, uh, we're thinking about broader audience. So can you just give us some sense, just very brief high level from your agency's perspective, like what the kind of data storage and dissemination look like? I'll just jump in quickly here. I think this is um, part of the reason why we wanted to um, pull this call together. Um, I think there's a lot that is being lost or not being shared in some unified or um, standardized way. And so I think the goal ultimately would be to, to do some data mining and then input some of the data that we have, which we now have quite a bit of data from various sources that have been used in various ways um, to, to try to put them on a map, um, whether it's, you know, just to put points on a map, but then maybe perhaps ultimately some analyses can be performed to then try to figure out some relationships that can lead to better scaling. Um, so, yeah, thanks for putting us back on track talking about data specifically and how we can maybe pull data together um, in a way. Uh, Christina and I came up with, um, started a survey that has not gone out on a broad level yet um, to both data users and um, data holders. So we'd be interested in hearing perhaps not only from people who may have ground ice data, but people who may in, be an end user and how they may use the data and what is important to them when they are looking at these data sets. Um, because we'd like to create something that would be useful to the broadest possible audience. 
But if anyone wants to jump in and talk about the data that they have or their agency has, um, go ahead. Um, so at the Geological Survey of Canada, we have uh, a lot of geotechnical borehole data that's freely available um, on our publication server, which is called Geoscan. Um, so those, I mean, it's a varying, like some have excess ice values, but that would be a small subset. Uh, you know, every, every, pretty much everything has gravimetric moisture content and some have volumetric. Uh, uh, and then, but yeah, as far as like the, the grand, uh, like if we think of the whole permafrost research community or engineering community, it's, it's very variable. Um, a lot of researchers keep their data to themselves and you might be able to get it <laughs> and you might not. Yeah, and there's a lot of data in the gray literature as well. So I think as people in academia tend to look at scientific journals, but I think there's a lot of gray literature out there that I think could be digitized and synthesized um, that could be used for this purpose. And but the like question the is, sorry? Go ahead, Hazel. I was just gonna follow up on what you said. Oh, that's Miriam, yeah. Oh, sorry, mixing voices. Sorry, Miriam, go on. <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that, you know, there's lots in the gray literature, probably lots that's um, not even in, you know, it would still have to be put input into, um, you know, a usable digital format. Um, so that's a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah, and uh, this is somebody. Mike from the data team. Just, just to follow up, up on that thread. So of course, you know, it's one thing, discoverability of data. There are all these dimensions to access two data sets like this, one being discoverable uh, data sets. This is the kind of four of these conversations we discover things, right? But there's so many other dimensions when we're talking about, you know, closing the usability gap. Um, it's one thing to have data available. It's pushed out to, say, uh, um, on a public website where you can download. Uh, but, there, you know, that doesn't mean that the user can, can you take up that data and use it. They have to have things like metadata to have a full description of how, you know, many things that we're talking about here, how the data were created, just to have a window into the methods to be, be able to evaluate, is this data set fit for my purpose? Can I use this for my purpose? And then in that metadata, you, you know, it would be nice also to have a description of what the data can be used for, what it should not be, et cetera. So just thinking about, you know, it's one thing, there are all you know, policy dimensions. Uh, one is one, you know, barrier with getting data out, there's incentives, there's cultural challenges, and also things that, you know, many groups are working on in the spatial data infrastructure um, uh, areas, local to global, is how do we, how do we kind of um, address these these issues through through standards, um, incentive buildings, um, you know, engaging the users in the process to you know create these you know spaces of awareness of what the users need, but then following up with okay, what are the policies, the standards, the cultural you know education awareness that we need to actually uh, get the data out and, and useful. Um, so just kind of there's a lot of dimensions to this, and we're kind of scratching the surface. We're here we're talking about discovery. Of course, there's so much that can be talked about in this regard. So starting with a survey, I think is a terrific uh, way to get the ball rolling and having this conversation. I'm happy we're doing that here. So just comment, but just many dimensions to this to this challenge. Thanks, Mike. It looks like Alexander, you have your hand raised. So first of all, about the data, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm on mute. So uh, about the data accessibility, uh, I remember before the COVID time, actually it was kind of webinar organized again, if I remember correctly, by the uh, Permafrost Carbon Network about this question, uh, the ice, uh, ice content, and it was even discussion about the, to establish a data set and we even discussed some metadata forms. I, I, I'm not sure if in this question or not, but uh, I think it would be establish a kind of uh, interagency uh, data set to put all data together because I have data from my boreholes mostly from Alaska but from Russia as well so it can be easily contributed and a few comments for that discussion in the chat about the gravimetric and volumetric ice content so generally speaking gravimetric 
can be uh, pretty easily converted to the volumetric just multiplying by a dry bulk density of the soil, except for I, I see two, two problems. First of all, this approach works perfect uh, when the ice content is close to the normal, uh, normal porosity of the soil. If we have really uh, excessive ice, like uh, suspended uh, cryogenic structure or very uh, thin, uh, very thick layers of ice, it might not work because the ice content by itself will, will affect the uh, soil bulk density. And the second problem is if we have really uh, the soil with some gravel content, will be questioned uh, about the, how the sample is representative. So if you have a little bit more gravel in comparison with normal, so it, it will affect a lot. But in general, yeah, it might be a good idea. So I, I will try it in the next, in the nearest time uh, to, to, to do this analysis at my data set and compare volumetric and gravimetric. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Sasha, the, the, uh, where you will get the bulk density? That's the, that's the question. <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not measuring volume of this, well, for bulk density, you need to measure volume of the sensor, uh, sample. Okay, now if you measure volume of the sample, you can, you know, you don't need to calculate gravimetric. You can do immediately uh, volumetric water or ice content. That is very true, but even for uh, just a Grad sample uh, based on soil texture and uh, amount of organic content, which might be estimated uh, through loss of ignition. Uh, again, with some level of confidence, uh, bulk density can be estimated based on soil texture and uh, loss of ignition. Yes. Can I jump in real quick? Um, we, uh, so I do coordinate the Permacost Carbon Network, and uh, we started. The ground ice conversation in one of our breakouts, which was led by Mary Tureski, and I believe probably quite a few of you participated there. I definitely know that Tom Douglas was part of that conversation. And uh, we will have another breakout this upcoming from a post carbon network meeting in November on ground ice and how to continue with different conversations. And uh, I can send the registration link into the chat here so that people that are interested can actually participate. It's a virtual meeting, so everyone's welcome to attend. Um, I think the issue with this a little bit is that we have lots of interest, we have lots of data, we don't have any funding right now to really task someone to mine data or to do work. And so the survey was a first step to really just get a, a hold of what information is even out there and where is it and how much is it? Like it's hard to really move forward without knowing what type of data is located on different servers and personal computers. And uh, we, yeah, we are hoping to get more information through that survey. Uh, this is Mike, is this a um, sort of a, like a um, electronic survey where you'll ask a series of questions or, so some of these questions I'm looking at your, your set of slides, um, slide five with some, I guess these are the survey questions. These look to me like kind of in-person semi-structured interviews where you talk to, you know, key people and then do like snowball sampling where you're getting more names. And then through that process, you're kind of deliberately collecting this information versus relying on, you know, uh, individuals to voluntarily submit a form. So is this, what's the strategy for this survey? Currently the survey is a Google document with a simple link and it has multiple tabs for data users and for data holders. And they can indicate in different columns, what kind of data they have, what the time frame is, and what type of data it is. So it's really very broad. It's not super detailed yet. And the goal would be to share this through multiple listservs and then keep sharing it to other people. Like if you have it and you know of other people who have data, you could just forward the survey link to them. And I don't know, Miriam, do you want to quickly show? Uh, oh, I could show it to you. Yeah, I can put the link to the survey that we created into the chat. Um, so hopefully that's visible to everyone. Um, 
And if you have any comments or feedback on things we may have missed in this initial, um, you know, reaching out, that would be also helpful. Um, uh, this is Mike. But again. Is I think this? generally it's Chris. Go ahead. So there's an international group that does this kind of thing, Arctic uh, Spatial Data Infrastructure. Um, I'm wondering if others on this call are, are engaging that group. This is one of the, you know, we're, we're dealing with lots of, um, you know, scientists, um, and it's not always easy to coordinate the, that activity with, for very good reasons, with those that are kind of more working on standards and, uh, you know, intergovernmental standards making to, to get, you know, better dissemination of data like this for broader societal benefits. Um, is this survey being coordinated at all with the uh, Arctic SDI working group or any related groups that do that kind of thing? More in the operational and kind of um, less, like more kind of practice oriented side of things. No, this was uh, this was initiated by a group of scientists, um, and Christina and I took it up. Christina, who leads the permafrost carbon network, um, that became a topic of conversation there. So this is how this all sort of is getting started. Yeah, the carbon people are very interested in knowing where all the ice is, just for the carbon emission purpose. But then we also realize that there are lots of different, that, that, that there are other needs for that, this type of data. And that's what we are trying to figure out as well. We don't want, just want to make it available for people that do carbon flux measurements, but also infrastructure and uh, other ecosystem type data needs. That's a, another thing we're trying to figure out. Go ahead. This is exactly the topic. So there are uh, spatial data infrastructure groups, uh, you know, from local, national, global scales, and this is exactly what they're, you know, designed. They're meant to do. That's their purpose to to get broader, multiple uses out of existing data information and, and knowledge hold, um, holdings. Um, so you know, just thinking about uh, the future of this, you know, clearly really important and hopefully ongoing. Uh, interaction between data team and the permafrost team on this topic, that'd be really great to try to structure an interaction with those those spatial data infrastructure groups that do this kind of thing systematically. And, and I'm, I'm bringing this up here in this context because I think that might be an avenue to structure a request for information rather than relying on, you know, you're, you're going to get, you know, champions of this effort in the science community, but I think a more systematic approach um, we could potentially coordinate um, in this, you know, IARPIC uh, it's be a nice objective for the IARPIC to try to tackle uh, bringing these groups together. So just just an, an, an idea in thinking about how to get more effective uh, survey results uh, and get more participation. Yeah, that would be really useful. Would you mind typing in that group into the chat box? Unfortunately, I'm... Oh, you can't. But you're online. I'm sorry. Yes, you're on the phone. And uh, I was also... Mike, this is... I'll tag team with you. I'm also a data team co-lead with Mike. And um, I was thinking about it, not from the international point of view, but maybe the Federal Geographic Data Committee could uh, lead a standards body that would address these questions. Of, of course, and it's the same, to my knowledge, it's the same group that, you know, um, engages at the national level in the U.S. participates in the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure. My information might be dated, but I believe that right. was the you know the governance structure, and this is a perfect topic I think for um, that they if not if they're not already working on something similar, um, I think it's a perfect topic to propose to them. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Miriam. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we'll follow up with you about maybe getting in touch with them. That'd be great. Because I, I think the FGDC is hosted or based out of USGS. And you should have some resources within your agency to, to initiate this. All right. And um, we do have Great. some efforts 
some efforts, uh, other related efforts, pilot study type things going on in that, you know, kind of, I'll call it standards-based um, groups that we could potentially link with. So I guess, um, Jonathan, I don't want to commit us, you know, but I think it'd be a good topic to explore. Um, future interaction, you know, nice, nice objective. And of course, getting the verification and input from the science community is absolutely critical to understand what the data are. They should absolutely be central to the process of, you know, not only um, designing, but also verifying things like metadata, uh, fitness for use, limitations. That's something that, you know, the standards-based bodies are not going to be focused on and always experts in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's going to be important. It's it's going to be hard to, I think, get people to contribute data on an individual level. Um, most mostly, you know, speaking from experience, um, the time involved in formatting it and getting some data sets into a format for a data call takes time. Yeah, I think small, you know, in addition to sending out the surveys, do a handful of, in, you know, phone interviews. Do it that way and maybe identify key people that are champions of the effort in the science community that want to take a, do a little extra work to, to get their data prepared, um, you know, to get into conversation about standards to, to uh, address broader societal uh, issues, things that their data can be, you know, weren't designed for but could potentially uh, inform um, just to kind of develop that community of interest. And then obviously, the you know participation you get from the broader survey you can use that as well but I think like you know five or so interviews by phone go a long way I'm a big advocate um, especially with this kind of thing and you you'll get uh, obviously better um, engagement if you're if you're uh, interacting one on one with with a select group. Yeah yeah we've had a couple of calls with a smaller group of scientists already um, who sort of helped um spearhead um this data survey in some ways so i think yeah keeping that going is is definitely valuable i see that we're at the top of the hour so i i guess i don't want to keep um keep people longer than necessary um, but thank you again everyone for joining thanks especially to brendan and tom for speaking um, and sharing their insights with us. And thanks for everyone else for the discussion. This has been all very helpful. Um, I've been reading through the comments. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to highlight a lot of that, um, but the comments will be um, saved in the chat as well. So if the, unless there's anyone else that has any um, last minute comments who'd like to jump in, I think we can wrap up this meeting.